Hi, welcome to Hello MD Live. I'm Pamela Hatfield. And I'm Dr. Perry Solomon, and we're here to bring you some more interesting stories from the world of cannabis. And congratulations, Germany. This is a big story, Perry. This is a, this is a huge story because Germany, joining now Italy, Chile, and a few other countries, mm -hmm. are legalizing cannabis for certain medical conditions that can't be treated by traditional pharmaceuticals. And they're going to allow the patients to buy cannabis in an actual pharmacy, which is even more remarkable. They can walk into their pharmacy, the government mm -hmm. is going to pay for it with their government insurance, mm -hmm. and the patients can pick up cannabis. That the, the German government is actually going to be growing. Right. And so what I love about this story is that as patients are going to be taking cannabis for these serious medical conditions, whatever they may be, the government is actually going to be tracking the data alongside and they're going to be doing the research as people are using it and this is huge. The data that they'll be able to generate from this is going to be enormous because like you said tracking the condition to the cannabis is gigantic and mm -hmm. before this the patients had to be able to get permission from the government, pay for it out of pocket, and so up until April, 647 people did it. So there's a huge backlog of people mm -hmm. who are going to be using cannabis legally now in Germany. Absolutely, and so hopefully other European countries will follow suit. I think that's what exactly what's gonna happen, especially when they start seeing the data coming out of Germany. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what's going on in Oakland now. The federal prosecutors have recently dropped a four-year case against Harborside, the largest dispensary in the nation, and they've been trying to shut it down for four years. Why? Why? For what reason? Well, U.S. Attorney Melinda Haig, back in 2012, said that Harborside was flouting federal laws, and she took it as her mission to shut it down. How did Oakland feel about this, seeing that they're based there? Well, that's where it gets really interesting. Oakland did not want them to shut the federal government to shut down. Harborside. Harborside serves thousands of patients, it creates tremendous tax revenue, and tons of jobs. So the city of Oakland sued the federal government. Wow. And mm -hmm. that's the first time that's happened for this, right? Well, I don't know if it's the first time it happened, but it, In this it, case, it pushed yeah. off the Justice Department long enough so that Harborside was able to stay open. But what's also interesting about this is that Melinda Haig recently stepped down, mm. and there's no, they gave no reason as to why this case was actually dropped. Do you think that this shows a change in the stance of the federal government? Well, the federal government has, is obviously becoming more lax. They've told the DEA to back off and to not, the DEA is not getting any federal funding no to, go, to go after organizations within states where marijuana is now legal. But I think it also shows that one person can have a tremendous effect on regulations, on laws, and on trying to uh, mobilize an effort like this. And, and now that she's gone, well, guess what? That the effort is no longer happening. Well, maybe the Attorney General, with a swipe of their pen, can actually change the schedule one classification for cannabis to schedule two and make these lawsuits completely go away. Well, it, that could happen. But it's we'll a slightly different story, and we'll have to yep. wait and see. So staying in Oakland, Dr. Solomon, what's going on there? There's actually an exhibit at the museum in Oakland called Altered States marijuana in California that opened in April running to September of this year. And so is this an educational exhibit about cannabis? It is a purely educational exhibit. They don't take sides one way or another, pro or con. They just give a lot of information about cannabis from raw plant to films, etc., talking about cannabis. And so I've heard that it's a highly interactive exhibit. It is. You can put your hands in these booths and be able to roll, touch the marijuana yourself. There's a confessional, a cannabis confessional. You can roll a joint? You cannot roll a joint, unfortunately. <laughs> For anybody who would like to, you can't. But but you can confess You can confess about things you've done with marijuana and post it anonymously mm -hmm. on a board. Mm -hmm. You can see film clips of Reef from Reef from Madness all the way to Nancy Reagan saying just, just say, say no. no. Exactly. That's just say no. And you were actually there, so you have first-hand hand knowledge. My of family, it. exactly. My family and I went there just to see what it was about. Oh. And uh, as a matter of fact, they told us that during the week they have school kids coming through just to get informed about cannabis. Right. So this is so interesting because we really need to have this dialogue going on from the very young to the very old and everywhere in between because of the cha changing landscape of what's happening and especially in November. In California there's going mm -hmm. to be a, a, a vote for a referendum legalizing cannabis in California so this is a great way to get information that you couldn't get elsewhere. Right, well that's fantastic and we hope that everyone that's local goes and sees it. It's, a, it's very close, easy mm -hmm. to get to and a tremendous exhibit. Right, so on to Alabama. What's the story there? So, Governor, Al Governor Robert Bentley signed a bill that's going to allow CBD oil into Alabama, legally. 
Now, why, what was the impetus for this story? So it's nicknamed Lenny's Law, and Lenny's family, she had epilepsy, and she had to move to Oregon in order to gain access to CBD oil for her epilepsy. Because she couldn't get it in Alabama. She could not. It was absolutely illegal. She could have been prosecuted, and Child Protective Services could have taken her away. And that's a big issue. It's a huge issue. Now, do you think some of it had to do with that Governor Bentley is a physician? I think that maybe as a physician standpoint, he was able to analyze the data and say, hey, this is a great law that we should pass. Well, I think it's a fascinating point because what you have here is the whole South is incredibly conservative when it comes to marijuana. And Alabama is one of the most conservative states. So perhaps his station as a physician allowed him to say and influence people that this was actually a good idea. As well as being an economic boom for mm -hmm. Alabama, perhaps. Absolutely. So what is their traditional economy? It's been cotton. Well, it's cotton, chickens, and maybe they're seeing in the future and saying perhaps now we'd be able to grow cannabis for medicinal reasons and have another source of income. Although I do have to say that that's in the future. It's way, in the, are, way in the future. And there are a lot of limitations to this law. So CBD oil will be legal, but there has to be a 3% cap on what the THC is within whatever oil is there. But baby steps. I mean, they start with oil and perhaps they'll get more progressive and allow other types of cannabis into the picture. Right. And so my hope with this is that other states, southern states, will see that Alabama is allowing this and guess what? People aren't getting high, nothing bad is happening, and it's supporting and helping the families who have sick children and other sick people. And it's treating, me treating medical conditions, which absolutely, is perfect. Absolutely, absolutely. So on to the AAA study. Well, that's a terrific subject. As a matter of fact, just this past week, the American Automobile Association, AAA, released a study trying to correlate in Washington the amount of THC that you'd have in your blood to the traffic fatality accidents that happened there. Now, can you actually do this, Perry? Well, can you do it, it accurately? It, that what they said in their study was the answer is no. Yes. Essentially, in Colorado and Washington, the blood limit that you can have in your blood for THC is five nanograms per milliliter. Mm -hmm. And they found that any range between one and 47 did not correlate at all with the traffic fatality accidents. So what I find interesting about this is that there's a there's an analogy that they're trying to make with the blood alcohol test that they do on the road for people drinking alcohol to that of doing cannabis. And guess it, what? It's not apples to apples. It doesn't it does not correlate. They found people who had very, very high levels of THC in their blood were completely coordinated, could drive, could do anything they wanted, while someone who had one mm -hmm. in their blood couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact now, unfortunately, twelve states in this country, if you have any cannabis in your blood at all, mm -hmm. you are declared unable to drive any. And that's the, that's the level of THC in your just, blood. Just correct? THC, it's called per mm -hmm. se. The, le the amount that you have is irrelevant. If you have any, you're guilty. And THC stays in the blood for how long? It depends on the person. Some can last for 100, if you take frequently, it can last up to three months. My goodness. Well, let's hope that, the, that somebody comes up with a new technology that makes this an accurate test because it's obvious that we do need to have some way to test the impairment of people on the road. You need to t be able to test it accurately and that correlates with how you can drive and your coordination. But that being said, you just shouldn't take cannabis, smoke cannabis, and drive just like drinking. Don't drink, don't drive, same thing with cannabis. Absolutely. So on to what were they smoking? Spice. What What is spice? Spice is considered a synthetic marijuana, but it's not marijuana at all. They call it marijuana because spice, which is a synthetic drug, actually binds to the CB receptors in your brain permanently. What's another reason that they would use spice? Because of the, it's not THC then? No, it's not THC and it's not detected oh. on traditional drug tests. So people buy it in gas stations. It's very cheap. It comes in these shiny foil packages. They roll it in a joint like they would marijuana. They smoke it and it creates a very euphoric high, but it also can create instant death. It creates liver damage heart damage, uh, kidney damage, all sorts of things. Well, and it could be anything. It could, they're usually made in China. You don't know exactly what's in it. So it gets shipped over here as a powder. Mm -hmm. It's made into a liquid using acetone, like nail polish remover, essentially right. a poison, right. colored with various dyes to make it look pretty, mm -hmm. and then sprayed on tea leaves and packaged like that. So yeah. people buy it, they think it's innocuous. It's nothing. Well, and unfortunately, kids get their hands on it, but it is lethal, it is poisonous. Um, the other interesting thing is that in 2015, 8,000 people were poisoned by this. Across the country, right? Across the country, although New York and Mississippi definitely have the highest rates. Huh. And they still sell it to anybody. They do. And But the, the big thing here is that politicians are using this as a way to grandstand to be against marijuana. But spice and marijuana, 
There's no correlation. There's, no, there's nothing to do with each other. Nothing to do with each other. Spice is not nice. That's the bottom line. That is the bottom line. Away. Don't do spice. Until next week, this is Hello MD Live. Thank you.